Well, I know a lot of my listeners probably won't relate to this, but I love the Real Housewives of anything and Bravo. If you could just do a, a training simulation of some sort, but it, you just hire those women to to yell at each other at a dinner table, but yell at each other with pertinent information that you have to be quizzed on and learn, I would it would really resonate with me. It would stick in. Welcome everyone to Return of the Mac. Today, we are going to be talking about the very sexy topic of security awareness. So security awareness training is important. We all know that. It's a part of basic user education. But as we know, no matter how aware users are uh, of cybersecurity and the threats that they face, especially uh, at the companies that they're at specifically, uh, they'll be caught off guard. I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of like a pessimist on this topic, but it could be because I've been in the industry long enough and I'm just, you know, I don't, I just don't know how I feel as a cyber practitioner and my faith in the human race, but specifically human race being the end user. So can the end user actually be trained and is this problem something that can be solved? Today, I am talking to Connor Swalm, who is the CEO and founder of Fin Security, which provides phishing simulation and security awareness training for MSPs. Uh, last week, we discussed, we had Phyllis Leon, we discussed, you know, the 20 security critical controls, CIS's framework adoption, and the importance of that to focus on security maturity. So it only feels just that we move into the, to, I, won't, I don't want to say the most basic, like basic bitch stuff. It's not the most basic, but we are going to move into something that, again, from a pessimistic point of view, needs to be solved. It's something we all do internally, but do we actually take it seriously? So because, again, new year, new us, we're going to start from the bottom, and the bottom is, in fact, the end user. Uh, we're going to talk about how security awareness field is adapting or evolving with the new integration of AI into everything. Um, so if you're a bad guy, how does AI really kind of benefit you? And then why Finn decided to focus on the MSP space or the IT service provider realm um, and that market in the first place. So welcome, Connor. Thank you so Thanks. much for joining me. Anytime. Thanks for having me on. I'm sorry that I couldn't fly to the other side okay. <laughs> of the country to hang out with you guys in your, uh, not your garage, right? It's your living room. You're yeah, like the, true startup mode. I love it. I'm, I'm not there anymore, but uh, yes, the hacker house. If you've ever watched Silicon Valley, if you have Mackenzie or if you're I listening. I definitely have consumed it. <laughs> that exact house, it's, it's almost the exact same situation we had uh, very early on at Finn is me my co-founder, Josh, who's one of my best friends, and our first employee, Curtis, who is an amazing individual. Uh, we all live together. And so we'd wake up and we'd just code all day long uh, until they that. stopped letting me write code because <laughs> I'm the worst developer here. Okay. So you, Josh, and Curtis, what characters are you from? <laughs> uh, so everyone compares... Uh, listen, listen. Of course, of course, people compare me to Ehrlich because I'm the worst developer. And I hate that. I hate that. He's I'm my a, favorite. Though. Ehrlich's your favorite? I mean, only because he's like kind of a piece of shit, and I love that. Like that's my, my favorite character trait in someone. I uh, Josh is definitely Richard. Uh, I would like to be Jin Yang. I think Jin Yang's the glue that holds everyone he, together. Well, I mean, he's kind of like the most badass. Yeah. What did uh, he invent? The hot dog thing? Was it like? Yeah, is, oh, I'm dog. not going to talk about that on this podcast. Sorry. Hot dog, can, not hot dog. Hot dog, not hot dog. I, we can be as inappropriate as we want here, but also within reason. So we won't talk about it. Just look up hot dog, no hot dog uh, for the Silicon Valley episode. It's probably, I forgot about that. It's probably one of my favorite things. Yeah. Um, cool. So welcome. Glad to have you here. What we do before we get into the nitty gritty of who you are, what you do, what Finn does, uh, we start with a nice hot topic uh, because we want everyone to be well versed in what's going on in the world. And, you know, these come out like a week or two after filming this. So they're still hot. We'll still call them. They're mild topics. They've been sitting under the warmer. Uh, but uh, this one is specifically about a new information. I shouldn't say new. Came out, started in April 2023. But this is information stealing malware, as we've all seen, uh, that are becoming more and more prominent. Atomic or Amos is an information stealer that has been seen in the wild with now more recently advanced capabilities. 
Uh, so this is a Mac OS info stealer called Atomic. Uh, they've had some updates recently uh, where now they introduce a payload of encryption so that it's actually in an effort to bypass uh, endpoint security software detection. Okay, so this was first seen in April 2023, and this tool was focused on harvesting information of a compromised host, of course, but because this is the angle of Mac OS, this also included keychain passwords, session cookies, files, system metadata, fake, but also it included the fake authentication portal uh, for extraction of the password. So hefty tool here. Um, over the past several months, this malware has been observed propagated via malvertising and compromised sites under the guise of legitimate software and web browser updates. All right, nothing new there. Uh, it's being sold for three grand a month. I don't know. I love Connor to introduce prices on here. I actually think it's cool. It's... Uh, so if you are looking to be a bad guy, this is what it's going to cost you in your initial investment. So this stealer is being sold for about 3K a month rental fee rental and uh they actually it looks like the bad guys had a promotion coinciding with christmas so they had a nice discount of 2k everyone loves a good deal there i know so why care about this hot topic well one information stealing type of malware that initial access foothold uh tactics as well as the evasion of edr uh and av so i keep adjusting my mic here you keep seeing me wiggle um that is something to get a point across but most importantly it's like when people tell me stop worrying about Macs comparatively to their windows devices i'm like mm, okay cool here's a good example of why to still give a about your mac devices uh internally uh and uh another point is again that tooling evolution so we've seen this continuous evolution of a lot of malware variants uh to the way that they are either deployed um or implanted is to evade detection and or even show an EDR saying, hey, we alert on this file, but it's not actually removed, um, which is what we're seeing a lot in our SOC right now. The malware, most interesting, has been seen impersonating uh, Slack via Google search advertisements, um, where they deploy a rogue Slack disk image uh, for installation. And it just essentially, when you open up that file, it prompts for a password, some of the easiest way to get um, a password into a system. And there is some versatility uh, within this also for the malvertising campaign. Back in September, uh, a uh, fraud site for TradingView leveraged a net support rat. So if a Windows device visited this fraud site, they got the net support rat. Or if it was a Mac, de Mac device, it was able to determine that and give it this atomic uh, malware. So lastly, I will add, let's just focus. If you provision a device, uh, you ensure, are you ensuring that Slack, Teams, Zoom, whatever type of applications are commonly used for operations day to day, is that something that you configure before you do any provisioning of systems to new end users? And also application control, because I could turn that into a drinking game on this show, talking about app control. If you are controlling at least the types of apps that end users can download or are considered you know, allowed, um, are you doing that? So Connor, thoughts on Atomic? How do you feel about this? You are in the realm of probably, oh, there we go, I almost lost my thing, probably where this is a common type of family uh, in your field. I would, I would make the statement that um, if you ask most, most people, not just end users, anyone, I mean, security professionals should know this, like what the little lock in your URL actually means, the little green lock. Yeah. A lot of people will, oh, my browsing is completely safe. And that is not no. true. <laughs> that just means it is a valid SSL cert, uh, which means a governing body somewhere, depending upon who you wanted to get it through, said, this looks like a good enough website, but really like 20 bucks and a business you address, can email enable. address yeah, yeah. It gives you a valid SSL search. So like when I talk to people about browsing, like go into these malicious websites, like, how do you actually know you're not on a malicious website? Like, you need to know what the URL is, know what the actual domain of the website is. Um, and then you should always have your browser scan anything you're downloading just nice. as another tool, like another checkpoint that doesn't mean it'll be safe 100 <laughs> yeah. percent of the time but it does mean you know if you go to slack.com and not wherever this malicious website was based on the ad you would uh, think yeah yeah that's kind of like a good habit or culture to instill in your people is like let's let's not trust search engines uh with yeah. seo poisoning too like let's kind of focus on the legitimate domains where you would download yeah. said software well um when you explain like the comment you made that really 
I guess didn't shock me, but immediately I was like, that's actually really smart by these people. They just buy keyword advertising in certain locales against certain yeah. keywords. It's like, yeah, if you if I go to Google right now and in my search bar I type Slack. Oh, good. I'm glad you weren't going to say Black Point or something. I no. Black point. I'm like, oh, don't get me in trouble. First thing I did <laughs> is an ad. But if you're not looking at the little tiny uh, language here that says, hey, this is a bought and paid for ad. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to Slack. It's like, that's yeah. exactly what you, in this case, I am going to Slack. But I imagine in other cases with these, with this malware, you're not. No. And people don't know that. Yeah. That's always, okay. So remember, don't trust your browser settings regardless if they say that yeah. they're protecting you like you're gonna have to do a little bit more due diligence that's a lot for an end user to consume by the way like oh all of the tips and tricks that you have like are these things that you you guys kind of include in your training modules or how you train people is also like hey this is more common like they are getting more sophisticated in the ways that they can get users to click and we leverage Google for everything. Sorry, Google, I'm not sponsored by you. Um, I know last week I said, talked a lot of shit about Google, but um, is this something that you guys kind of train on module wise? Yes, uh, so there's a couple of things, a couple of ways, uh, I guess I'll tell that you can actually get this information into a user in such a way that they remember it, or it, it puts that gut feeling in their stomach when they're somewhere that feels a little off. Uh, the first is just direct, directly asking them like, hey, um, Here's a web page. Can you click on the URL for me? You'd be oh. shocked how many people can't do that. Um, and that's a very, very important piece of information for us because it's like this person's security journey is starting on this end of the security like awareness spectrum. Okay. We need to start educating these people and incredibly, uh, I guess, not easy to understand, but start with the simple topics and say, okay, this is a URL. This is what's actually, this is what visiting a website means. This yeah. is what the little green lock really means. You shouldn't always trust it, so on and so forth. Um, and the second piece is, um, I think the most effective training you could ever give anyone, the most effective talks that you could ever give uh, when in terms of people like taking something out of it is, hey, here's three simple things. And it's not like, go by this, go by that, go by this. It's my advice is always the same. If you enable MFA, if you have a VPN of some sort, I'm not even going to talk about if you have the right VPN or if you're using it oh. properly. It's like if you've make if you've made the effort and you have MFA on everything, uh, and you only do work on your company's work device, right? You're miles ahead of of the average individual. You're probably it's a very good place to start. Just start there, and then we'll talk about more. Uh, I was just going to say, do you have like a do you guys have a graphic of the spectrum of end user awareness maturity that you can leverage? Uh, we don't have uh, a <laughs> yeah. written out graphic. I definitely have it in my head. Like, okay, that's good. <laughs> these topics, the yeah. So, if anyone wants to know where do you sit on the <laughs> where do you sit on the line of maturity, uh, Connor can probably help you out with that. I know in relation to Atomic. So, as far as what our Black Points Threat Operations Center has been seeing, uh, we actually I was looking doing some search. We haven't really seen any Atomic from what I can see, but we see a lot of other info stealing type of malware and some loader malware, but solar markers kind of like a ton of this, a ton of solar marker more recently too. Uh, Redline, Remcos, um, deployed in the fashion of an executable or MSL file and then followed by some PowerShell. And if you are someone who said, I don't give a any of that, um, if you're a hunter, so you just know typically you're looking for three to four words separated by like a hyphen um, and then pretending to be something like an installation package or some sort of template, uh, and also to note, we have seen tools with Solar Marker specifically. Um, I won't name any EDRs. Uh, we don't, you know, we try to play nice here, but uh, where we have seen this trend where EDRs are alerting on the initial file, but they're actually not removing the file or the .lnk persistence in general. So um, some fun tips and tricks there uh, to note. Uh, so even though we haven't seen it in our Threat Ops Center, it doesn't mean that they aren't targeting some specific market vertical or field um, or organizations out there. Uh, so questions, Connor, we met in Orlando, if I can recall back in my many days of travel um, yeah. at one of the IT Nation conferences. I was blown away by just hearing your story, how far you guys have come. So congrats on that for Finn. Um, I wanted to go ahead and just get started on the most basic level. Again, basic bitch here. First, tell me a little bit about Finn as a company, um, how you were inspired to start this company. Um, and then more importantly, what differentiates you from 
the no befores of the world, the other security awareness training platforms. Oh, and then I know this is like a four prong question. So I apologize. Um, <laughs> you might have to remind like, me of all me to write this down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, so what sets you apart? Actually, I'll wait on the other one, which is the MSP space specifically. So how were you inspired to start this company? And what sets you apart from all the others? Sure. So I was uh, with a few other people just building random security tools that I thought were really cool. And um, for anyone trying to build a company who has ever tried to build anything, that's not a great way to start building a company. <laughs> what I think is cool is not what people are willing to pay for. Uh, and so we started talking to every organization we could. And um, you alluded it to it earlier. I'm from Delaware and I live in Delaware right now. Very small state, very closely connected. If I want to go talk to business owners or I want to talk to VPs at a bank, like tons of bank here in Delaware. I just go do that. I went to school with their kids, my family's friends with them somehow. Oh, like, nice. We know each other. It's a, it's a very homey hookup. Name. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd go talk to them. Uh, and for whatever reason, all of them talked about my users keep making mistakes. No matter what I buy, it doesn't feel like the training is working. I feel like I'm wasting my money, my effort, my energy, my security team hates me. So, oh, okay. In that process of Getting all of that feedback, which largely, you know, congregated around end user training and getting people to behave a little differently, we ran across one MSP. And that MSP said the exact same thing. He gave us the whole landscape, the players in the space, why they were good, why they were bad, how long it's been going on, what the scale of the problem was. And the reason we started, we decided to go all in on awareness training is because that MSP ended the conversation with us by saying one thing. Don't even build me a better tool. Build me something here that's easier to use, and I'll work with you tomorrow. And like quote it, quote whatever MSP partner says. Yeah, that. build me something here, but easier to use. I love. That. And you know, at the time, I was like twenty. Set the bar really low there. Yeah, I was living in my mom's basement. I was like, that sounds that sounds like the opportunity I've been looking for. Um, and that started uh, not only a relationship with that MSP, uh, but Hey, can you introduce us to your friend? It's a great, I didn't know what an MSP was at the time. Now looking back at it, it's like, that's the perfect way to get into the industry. It's like, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem for you. Do you have 10 friends that you can introduce me to? It's like, I know. It's like, yeah, let me put you in a text thread. We're actually talking about this now. It's like, that's the level It's of, the pyramid scheme we yeah. didn't realize existed. Exactly. <laughs> actually, oh, I don't want to compare the, the channel to that, but yes. It's it's a very like um, if you ask people how they make most of their purchasing decisions, you'll get some variation of I go online at Reddit or I ask mm -hmm. my friends. It's like, oh, yeah, that's pretty much it. You just ask your friends what they do and who they like and what they like doing. And that's right. 90 percent of the time. Well, so if anyone is new to this type of uh, mentioning of the channel, I know I talk about it in every episode, but everyone has an IT service provider, like a general practitioner in a way. So um, just keep that in mind as we talk through a lot of these important topics is who's the friend you're calling and most organizations not just smb but even large organizations right we can't yeah. trust google so we're gonna maybe we can trust reddit we probably trust reddit more than we can trust google weirdly enough but yes yep sure. all right so what sets you apart you know not building something obviously but like it's not <laughs> what sets you apart from other tools out there now today so there's two two things that we believe uh the first is uh specifically for the msp space if you take an action in a tenant there should be an option to expand that action to a, every set of tenants that you would like that action to apply to a very specific example i can give if you make a phishing template as as a as a MSP partner of Finn, and you're like, you know what? I wish all of my other clients had this as well. There is a button to click that says, "Give this tenant, give this template to these te uh, tenants as well, and have it run in the in the phishing campaigns that are running right now." It's like scale all of the actions from one to many. That was like the biggest gripe for that first MSP we listened to. It's like, I don't want to have to repeat things. I want largely the exact same experience for all of my clients. Let me do that easily. Um, and the second differentiation is I, I'm going to go back to an experience I had in college. I studied math in college. I consider myself a hobbyist. I still study it to this day. I bought a bunch of textbooks. I have them right here and I'm going through them. I love it. It's for whatever messed up reason in my head. It's just what I enjoy. Um, try talking to anyone about math. It's what got me up in the morning. Like 
in college. The only reason I was there, I had a, a successful real estate career at the time. I was like making money. Um, I was there to study math. And anytime I try to talk to anyone about how much I, I enjoyed that, the conversation was over before it started. It's like, they didn't care. They didn't. It's like, Hey, I study math. Like, Oh, actually my friend's calling me. I'm going to go. Goodbye. It's like, Oh, okay. And the reason I bring that up. That's what you did on a Saturday night or Friday night in college. uh, Had a math party. I did a lot of that. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Did a lot of undergraduate research. A lot of math stuff. Yeah. I also, yeah. It's fun. I like I said, it's what got me up in the morning. I liked it. I swear I didn't pull out my headphones just now. That's <laughs> my, fine. My thing got muted. I was like, I swear it wasn't because you started talking about math, but like, it, 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 I it could have been. I would have known you in college or high school because maybe I would have had someone to help me with my math. I'm used to it. Uh, I'm used to it at this point. <laughs> um, the reason I bring that up is because if you go talk to um, the employees on the front line, so not the MSP employees and the employees in those clients that are on the front line, and you say, what are your thoughts on awareness training? What are your thoughts on security? Do you know cybersecurity? You will get the exact same response. It's just a, hey, my friends call me. I got I got better stuff to get back to. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. It's like there is this complete disconnection of they don't believe they have a part in it. They feel uh, like they're getting talked down to, whatever. They feel inadequate in some way. There's a lot of emotions that I can go into that I've heard every, virtually every employee I've ever talked to explain to me. And so what we decided to do from the very beginning is not make the content the reason somebody should work with us. We're going to aggregate content kind of like YouTube. And what we'll do long term is we'll say, if we are this aggregation machine, we can, um, through our own LMS, we can see what content in which sets of people because of their vertical, because of their business side, because of their job title from that we pull in from Azure, whatever it is, this is likely to actually resonate with them a little bit more because of all the data we have. And if we make our differentiator the content we can generate in house will never, will never be able to get to that point where we can actually give people what would be effective for them because we're limited in the scope of what we can provide. And so that's kind of the second thing that we've done is we don't make any of our own content. We license it from other awareness training companies, from professionals, from cybersecurity practitioners. Right. And we just let meritocracy take over. I was just going to say aggregating the things that are going to be more relevant and useful is probably the fastest way, not reinventing the wheel necessarily. Yeah. Um, A really good friend of mine um, who is a security awareness training, I call him an expert. He's been doing this for like 15 years. Uh, He made a statement to me early on that was, if an employee leaves their awareness training, training, and their only thought is, that wasn't the worst thing I've ever done. That's top 10. That's that's top 10%. It's like, that is the best that we could hope for right now. I was like, oh. That's how low it is. All right. Uh, let me see if we can make this a little better. So, and do you get, do you do those kind of Yelp reviews for your platform in general? What for specific training modules or videos that there's those simulations are going through so that they can rate it yeah. after the fact and say, Hey, this like really sucked. Or like, I actually feel like I learned something and paid attention the whole time. It's, it's not as uh, in line. I'm air quoting for those of you who are just listening. Uh, it's not as in line as I would like it, but we do solicit feedback not only from the MSPs, but from the end users as well. It's like, hey, right. what were your thoughts? On, was the length good? Was the topic good? Was it relevant to you? Why or why not? We do all yeah. that. Well, I know a lot of my listeners probably won't relate to this, but I love the Real Housewives of anything and Bravo. If you could just do a, a training simulation of some sort, but it, you just hire those women to to yell at each other at a dinner table, but yell at each other with pertinent information that yeah. you have to be quizzed on and learn. I would, it would really resonate with me. It would stick in, but, <laughs> um, okay. So again, I was saying like, I'm, I am an optimist at heart <clears throat> for the most part. Uh, but when it comes to end user training, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I'm really like pessimist as a practitioner. I think, that I would rather rely on technical policies and configurations and again, like other tools to fix the problems we see with the end user versus trying to, you know, fix the end user's awareness. Um, And I'm not saying that that's the the good viewpoint of the world. It's just, you know, I don't have time to sit there and measure each person's uh, out of, you know, a 200 person company. I can't go to every single person and quiz them or just understand, like, did you cheat? Did you actually understand uh, the content? Like, who are the people who are clicking the most? Of course, we can track those metrics. But do you think we as practitioners, you know, we've been left with a bad taste um, for end users as far as security maturity goes. Do you think the end user 
can be trained, that this is a problem that can be solved. I'm betting that it can be. Um, and until some form of generalized AI that removes the need for humans to exist in the line of productivity to create a service or, or a product, um, humans are going to be technologically enabled, not removed from the production. Oh, I like that. So, it's like, yeah. So what we've seen over the last 20 years in Verizon's data breach and investigation report backs this up is humans have gotten progressively worse at recognizing social engineering. There's a lot of factors that go into that. One is how much more technology we all interface with. The second is how much more we're targeted. Right. Um, so yes, I'm willing to bet it can be. I think it's going to take a lot of things that do not exist today. Um, <laughs> the primary one of which is just empathy. <laughs> like, um, and let me, let me, I guess oh, no, I'm bringing an EQ here. Uh, I love, no, I love it. <laughs> you can call West Spencer. He'll tell you I'm like a empathy junkie. This is, that's where Wes and I agree a ton. And we talk, I call him all the time to talk about this is um, in general, right? outside of security, if you had more empathy in your life, your life would probably go way better, like Absolutely. way smoother. Oh, I um, love that. So let's talk about how would it exist in security? Is Why is it that most end users, when you talk to them, and I'm, I, I use end users as a stand-in for employees on the front line, the people who are making these mistakes that we're blaming them for. Why is it that they feel less supported less productive, less capable, and less uh, understanding of the overall landscape than ever. I think that's because the security industry is failing, reaching out to these people who have no understanding of security to begin with. And it's not their fault because it's not their jobs. I have yeah. no understanding yeah. on how to weld. I'm not, like, if someone's like, oh, you don't know how to weld? You're a loser. It's like, <laughs> I I'm not a welder. I what? It's like, right. That's largely their perspective. And But I will say this. The difference is everyone has a place in security. I don't necessarily have a place in a welding shop. I never will. Don't want to. Um, so what I would say is um, it is doable. I think the I think security needs more empathy. Um, and, oh, I just had a really, I had a really good example that just flew out of my brain. I hate that when that happens. happens. Um, so you don't belong in a welding shop. Yeah. But uh, the security thing. I had a lacrosse coach in college. And he went through this exercise with me. And I think the security industry could take heart from this example. Uh, and he pulls us all together, a whole team. And he says, raise your hand if you play defense. And of course, only the defenders raise their hand. And he goes, okay, Shocker. all of you are wrong. Go run. And then made us run until some of us puked. And we're like, ah, oh, we hate this guy. This coach sucks. Blah, 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 blah. Pulls us back in. He goes, raise your hand if you play defense. Everybody raises their hands. And he goes, that's the right answer. All of you play defense just on different sides of the field. And I was just like, oh, yeah, that actually makes sense. So how do we take that to securities? Everyone has a place in security. For some, it's in a sock, managing responses and looking at alerts and triaging things. For some, it's just doing the job of not clicking right. on the wrong email in the course of doing your daily activities. All of them are a part of security. Everyone just has a different place in it. We're all defenders. I actually like the that tagline a little bit better than security is everyone's responsibility, which just sounds like obviously the government came up with that. But I do like the whole like we're all defenders. I think that that's far more, like you said, empathetic. And um, it, it does kind of, I don't know, resonate a little bit deeper with the end user of, oh, I'm totally yeah. responsible. I can be targeted for yeah. the specific role or position I'm in. And... What is the risk if I am compromised to some extent? And then also in your personal life, I think that people realize that they are kind of the defenders of their personal life when it comes to their own data um, and how that can bleed into not just their job and career, but also it can destroy people's lives once yeah. if they have been targeted specifically and wired a bunch of money or something has happened. I think a, um, a cultural belief that a lot of people have is like your work stops at 5 p.m. It's like you have two versions of yourself, the nine to five and the not nine to five. It's like, okay, uh, I could get that. And everyone should be able to disconnect from their work, especially if it's mentally taxing or they don't in, in enjoy it as much as others enjoy their work. However, with the invention of work from home and all, a lot of people, I think the last time I looked, it was like 20 something percent of Americans working from home. If you go home and you're on your personal devices doing work or they're connected in any way, shape or form, it's like, which they always are. Unfortunately, right. look at, unless uh, you carry two phones around, <laughs> right? 
look at, la- I think it was LastPass, where it's like a Plex server on a personal device yep. of a DevOps engineer. It's like, oh, it's, who had that on their security bingo card for 2023? It's right. Like, That's nobody. So, um, so what I, what I mean by that is there is now this, like this crossover of our personal lives impact our own security and our work security impacts our personal lives. And so all of these things that you're teaching users on, this is how you recognize real malicious websites. This is what a malicious, malicious email or text message or, or phone call or voicemail is going to look and sound like all of that translates into their personal life. Um, I, I, I imagine like a lot of MSPs that listen to this call the second any one of my family found out that I did fishing and I'm air quoting again, I do fishing. That's what my entire family knows of my job at this point. I just get nonstop emails from my entire family. Is this fishing? Is this fishing? Is this fishing? Oh no. I mean, Um, you've trained them without knowing. (laughs) Correct. Uh, Some of them, they are like, yeah, delete this. It's like, just, you're not being targeted, but this is not real. Others. It's like, right. no. That's a JC Penny marketing email. Looks like you signed up for that. Would you like me to unsubscribe you from the list? Oh, so you're talking about like your grandma or your mom at that point? (laughs) A lot of family. A lot of family. Yeah. I have a big family. So, no, the prince is not contacting you from Nigeria to offer you something. And no, that cruise ship is not giving you free tickets to the cruise. Oh. Well, you're doing you're doing the good work there. Okay, so you kind of mentioned AI a little bit, and I think. You know, I've seen a lot of presentations recently at some conferences where they focus on the introduction of AI to curate better phishing exploits. You know, of course, they're doing other things, but we see not just that, that getting the user to click the link, but also more watering hole attacks, things that we're talking about, like these malvertising campaigns. And then, of course, introduction of malware variants or specific modern rats that are sitting there trying to be designed to evade AV and EDR um, uh, through that system compromise. So in the field of security awareness, like what is your company doing or how is your team also adapting and evolving to these more, any, well, I shouldn't say more advanced, but these shifting evolutions of these tactics and tools. Sure. So if you think about, I guess, what is, what is AI going to do for phishing from a Let's let's try to take the highest, like the thirty thousand foot perspective on that. No, oh, yes, um, it's going to make it more realistic by generating more accurate context around the individuals. Mm-hmm. So if you you could find a way to find a company online, look at the way people talk to each other on LinkedIn, get some other publicly available information. Maybe you get a free account on like a skip tracing tool, like Seamless or some other, and then you're able to target those individuals based upon their role at a company who they're likely to be inter- interacting with and what tools they're likely to use as a result of uh, hmm. there's um there's some website I used to use <laughs> to figure out what tools people were using. It's like all of that exists uh, and you could combine all of that and you could write phishing emails and mass using all of that context. Not all of it's going to be accurate, but for those that are accurate, it's like, wow, that's scary. And you just so- gave the 101 of how to do really good phishing hack and you're like, by the way, if I was to fish, this is what I would do. That's, that was the motivation for starting the company initially before we did awareness training was, uh, we wanted to fishy people and not go to jail. Yeah. That was it. It's like, that's that's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Tricking people's fun. It's like, it's a very sophomoric perspective at the time. And we've (laughs) kind of, you know, grown up, but at the time it's like, let's just fish people and not go to jail for it. It's like, all right, that's fun. Um, so that's what we've done. We built this really powerful fishing simulator. It doesn't do everything that I just described, but it does generate context because we have integrations into Azure and other tools that MSPs use and their clients mm-hmm. are using. So we have this information because of the relationship we have um, with, with our partners. And so all of this context is generated. All of this context is mostly publicly available at this point, given how much data exists for ex- especially large companies. And so um, what I would say is gone are the days of the Nigerian print scams working, you know, I'm going to take an entire topic of like uh, elderly scamming and put it to the side because we could talk about what that actually looks like yeah. right now because it's a little different than what's happening in you know the the working world that I'll call it professional world whatever. Um, all this context is generated, and at some point somewhere, a person is going to have to recognize that that is not valid traffic because all the conversations I've had with companies around their email gateways and, and attacks that they're getting that are 
like showing up on their the enemies at the gates. Not to not to quote a movie title, but um, <laughs> it's okay. This is a nerd podcast. So you can uh, go I played, as deep as you want. Hey, I've played World of <laughs> Let's Warcraft. Let's not talk about math, but yeah, <laughs> I've played World of Warcraft since I was third in third grade. I still play it. So if you want to talk about the peak pinnacle of nerdum, <laughs> it's me. Oh yeah, no, I had a stepbrother um, who was a roommate also who played World of Warcraft every day. And it's, other illegal activities, but certainly enjoyed World of Warcraft. Yep. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Um, <laughs> gone are the days of, like, uh, you mentioned it, like the, hey, there's a Nigerian prince or, or yeah. you have a long lost relative that just needs a hundred bucks. The help to desk give you. scans, the yeah. click here coupons. Yeah. That, those are, would you say those are gone? There's probably, they're, I don't they're, think they're gone completely, uh, specifically because of, how easy those are to but like, they conduct. still if you're the bad guy it still requires like they probably looked at that and say oh this still requires a level of communication and constant yeah. engineering back and forth with the targeted user but now we're seeing things where like oh i can do this much easier without having to just install some piece of malware or loader that's going to actually load malware on a system and yeah. get full access and also keystroke logging and have the password and bing bang boom yeah, I, I've always thought about it like this. What does AI do today for most people's jobs? It enables it in some way. It lets them do something a little faster, a little a little better w with more information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just view phishing people as a job because it, it literally is in some foreign countries. Um, what is that going to do? Well, it's probably just going to enable it, make their job a little easier, give them a little more information, give them better targeted emails. It's like that's all it's going to do for now. Like I said, until some, some kind of generalized AI work, it exists and humans right. don't need to be in the chain of productivity here. It, it'll be more of that. Well, and that's something I noted, I think on like the end of year stuff of where we're seeing trends in jobs, jobs in general and security people coming into the industry. It's like, well, and maybe this is someone that's coming in to run a security awareness training program or needing to understand these more advanced inclusions like AI ML, but prompts, having the capability as a security practitioner to understand AI, to build out prompts, to build out the tools that ingest data and understand the information in order to be better at it. You know, we're going to see, an, uh, I think, an increase of those types of very specific roles, probably not at small businesses, but certainly at the large organizational sizes. Yeah. Prompt engineering is a, a skill in and of its own. Okay. So... The last part of that question is, do you think this, I mean, that's kind of a loaded question. Do you think we can solve this problem? I think so. Uh, and I think so for the following reason. Um, the first statement I'd like to make is in order for a human to be in a position to fall for social engineering, every piece of technology you use to prevent it has, has already failed. It's like, whether that's your email gateways, whether that's a, a Microsoft's hmm. internal stuff, whether right. that's any other security tool you buy and, and let's say uh, let's go on the edr side and like the endpoint monitoring and the agent side it's like if that person is able to download malicious uh software it's like all of your detection uh, unless you detect it after the fact the roi all, is no longer there all of your prevention we're now we're now okay thinking of i can't think left versus right we're now <laughs> doing we're now in the realm of ir potentially because of right what's happened all of your software, all of your security software had to fail. And yet the only person that gets, the only thing that gets blamed in all of that is the, end is user. the person. Yeah, is the end user who is the most uneducated on average when it comes to security, who feels the least prepared and who is the least knowledgeable of what threats are actually facing. Well, sometimes those end users are the technical people of the industry yes. too, or of an organization. It can be your help desk or your IT support or your network admins. Like those people are heavily targeted too. So I bet they feel just terrible going home after that work day. It's true. And I was also, I was reading some report. I wish I had the name because now I just feel like I'm quoting nothing. <laughs> uh, it basically said um, security, regardless of your security proficiency, mm -hmm. you are equally as vulnerable to social engineering um, as people who have no security proficiency. I like that. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, so yes, I'm not just talking about people who aren't in who aren't in. I'm air quoting again because everyone's in security in my mind. I'm trying to trying to get that through my head. Um, <laughs> it's like we're the, all uh, defenders. 
it's like Tony Robbins is like, uh, if you want to be a smoker, just don't, don't identify as being a smoker. So, <laughs> oh, do you want a cig? It's like, don't ask, oh, what, what kind do you offer me? It's like, no, I don't smoke. It's like, you need to get that. That needs to be right. a mentality. Is uh, you are a person who identifies as no longer being a smoker. It's like everyone should identify as being a part of security. Um, so um, what I would say is why I think why I think we can actually teach people to recognize this. So our mission at fin my mission and, and what I've been telling every other awareness training company I could get in front of because I talk with the founders and people at this companies all the time because we're all defend we're all in this together and security is such a big landscape that we're all going to win. We can all win, right? If we do the right thing. So I would say this, if I, um, if I can look at what attacks are coming into your email gateway, I can look at all of the data your users have generated around phishing, whether it's from simulated phishing for us or reported phishes through Microsoft or reported phishes through some other mechanism. I can say mm -hmm. these attacks are, are likely to get through at some point. It's just a numbers game. This is the certain segment of your population that is vulnerable to this kind of appeal, these kind of tool sets, uh, the, the scams that are coming in uh, with, with uh, this kind of uh, action that it asks you to take, whether it's log in here, download this, whatever it is. All of that contributes to the vulnerability a user actually has without them being aware. And I can take the emails that are coming into your gateway. I can flip them into an assessment that I know is relevant to that user because of all the context I've been able to generate on that user right. and teach them. This is how our platform edited this specific phishing scenario, whether it was a text, a voicemail, an email, a DM on LinkedIn, whatever it was, we can do all that a, a long term. Then I can actually teach that user how to recognize the exact attack that is likely to get them the next time it happens. And my goal is to my goal is just to fish them first. And the statement I always make, it just wraps it up really nicely is we need more scrimmages and less batting cages. Right now, I like that fishing assessments are batting cages. Can you put a ball on a tee and swing and hit it? Yeah. All of them. Every American, everyone listening to this podcast can hit a ball off a tee. Can you hit a fastball? We need to know that if we're going to put you in a game and you're in a game, if you're in the front line, if you're in a company right. working today, but online, if they get you're in hit the game. in the crotch with that fastball, they're immediately going to remember what it felt like. They're probably going to get <laughs> better at hitting that ball. They're going to know what that fastball is going to look like and avoid <laughs> yeah. it the next time. That's the yeah. way I'll put it. Or avoid it entirely, I guess, versus um, hitting it. So report yeah, that's, it now. Just <laughs> correct. Yeah, I'm just glad um, you didn't make a football reference. But yes, I'm not a big football fan. Um, I'll go to. I'm rooting for the Eagles because I'm near Philly, and it'll get oh, me to. Yeah. It'll get me to a Super Bowl party <laughs> where there's free food and free drinks. So oh. that's why I'm, I'm voting for the Eagles right now. <laughs> um, but that's what I think the industry is going to move towards long term: is taking all this context that's generated and actually flipping it into something that's going to simulate the real world as users are completely unaware of it. Right. And if you take a very similar approach to training, making it relevant to a user based upon the style of the content, the topic of the content, um, and delivering it in at a poignant time where they're not likely to be in the midst of juggling seven or eight different projects, but you give it to them when they have a little bit of downtime, and it's like, hey, this will take five minutes. To take a look at it. Uh, and you make it interactive, uh, I think we'll get a lot more uptake in terms of people training that unconscious, hey, something's weird here, that alarm should go off. I'm just going to click this report a fish button instead uh, mm -hmm. right now. Just doing that um, would be amazing. Now, granted, we've chosen the hardest thing to changing human behavior is the one of the only unsolved problems that exists in the world. <laughs> It'll probably <laughs> exist forever. Yeah. <laughs> And it's incredibly hard. So it's like we've chosen the impossible. I get that, um, but I'm I'm willing to give it give it a good faith effort for sure. I love that. All right. Well, to wrap up this lovely discussion, too. You know, we talked a little bit about it in the beginning, but again, like your customer base or kind of where you guys are targeting right now is the channel and those MSP players and those partners. So looking at IT service providers, and of course, you know. My, I'm, I'm a little bit new to the space too, as far as understanding security maturity as it relates to like how they're selling, what they're investing in, and how they understand everything in the the big wide world of security. But why for you? Why why the MSP? Like, what do you have to offer them? I figure this is a good one to like wrap it all up on because like get on your soapbox, bro. Like, what are you going to offer them? Like, but not like offer them like a discount. But why? Like, why are they integral to this? overall human behavior change um, revolution? 
I would say this, uh, small businesses are targeted, whether they like, they like to believe it or not. I think all businesses are targeted and there's just way many more small businesses. Mm. Small businesses have neither the education nor the money to hire security expertise. And literally what I mean by that is the owners of small businesses are so, I guess, I want to say good and focused on, on running their small business. You cannot expect them to have reasonable uh, understanding of the security industry in general, enough so to even hire an expert that could work with them internally. Hmm. So given that narrative and, and, and that reality, it has to be through some kind of partnership and MSP. So it's quite literally the only way I see small businesses being able to get any modicum of security posture in place is through an MSP, through that partnership, through that coaching, through whatever you want to call it. I'm not even going to say VC so or VCIO. I'm just going to say MSPs have, are the people that have the security and IT expertise, and you're lending it to all of your small businesses that you work with whenever you work with them. Uh, and so that's why I think the MSPs are poised to win. Not only is cybersecurity growing, but with cyber insurance requiring being more onerous, with compliance requirements being more onerous, right. with reporting requirements being more onerous, with targeting increasing, with it, with it, AI making it easier to target businesses in a host of different ways, with foreign nations funding companies that are legitimate in that foreign country to just steal money from other businesses. Uh, I think small businesses cannot exist without a security posture anymore. And I see security as such a complex thing at this point that any tool that says, just click this button and you're secure, a hundred percent guarantee we secure you. They're just blowing smoke. Right. Um, and, it, and it's not, and if they, and here's the proof, it proofs in the pudding. Stop if they weren't blowing now. smoke, yeah. yeah, if they weren't blowing smoke, they'd be a trillion dollar company by next year. It's like, <laughs> that's it. That's how valuable they've solved the problem. Right. That's how valuable making good on that statement would be. I love um, that. So that, that's what I would say. I think that's why MSPs are going to win is because somebody's going to have to, the security expertise has to exist in the small business. And I just don't see a world where a small business can get that on their own anymore. Um, why we focus on the MSPs, quite frankly, anyone who's listening to this or, or you, if you've read any book on how you should think about building a startup or building good software, or uh, I just have the book right here. I just bought this book and actually it's oh, my book stack. I just bought this book right here. Cyber oh. for Builders. Cyber for uh, Builders. Okay. Uh, really good so far. Um, anyone who's read any books like that will understand the, the, the riches are in the niches, right? You got to figure out in a world where anyone can buy anything online from largely anyone else around the entire world. Why are you the best at the exact thing in the world at what you've just described? Uh, and so that's why we decided to focus, focus on the MSPs is because when we looked at the overall market, like no before and every like proof point, co sans, uh, uh, there's like tons of these billion dollar organizations that have awareness training offerings. It's like, right. Well, they're not really focused on the MSP. The use case is there to focus exclusively on them and help them win through better automation, uh, through more, you know, common sense deployment opportunities and stuff like that. So that's yeah. why we decided. To and in turn, enabling downstream customers, like you said, the SMB space specifically. Yep. Um, all right. Well, you guys heard it first from Connor himself, but we are not just the defenders, but the MSPs, the channel, our partners, the channel. Um, you you really do have a leg up, and and this is probably a valid path for a solution to this human behavior problem. I love that. Yeah. All Thanks right. Well, on. are you going to be at Nerdio? I feel like where are you going? Where am I going to see you next? I will be at Right a Boom. Right a Boom for sure. Right on. Okay. Uh, that's probably the next time I'll see a lot of people listening to this podcast <laughs> as well. So I'll be at right a boom. All right. Come bo bother Connor in Vegas. Um, <laughs> I'll be and Not if I'm at the uh, craps table. Don't bother me then. Uh, um, if I'm winning, come bother me because then we can celebrate together. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Connor, for being on the show and, and diving into this topic. I hope uh, everyone was able to take away some good key points. Again, I always say no matter if you're like, a regular end user in this case, a noob or an expert, all of this is extremely relevant. And um, yeah, we will see Connor at Right of Boom. If you're not going, you should. Uh, Registration still open. Come, I think we still only have a, 10 spots left on our CTF. So if you're bored, Connor, come to our CTF too. I'm sure we can hook you up with that. But um, awesome. th thank you again on another successful return of the Mac. And I will see you next time.